have seen the seasons in the city coming and going. And today a new season starts for us as family. As a last word, I want to say something as an uncle. I hope Oscar will start his own healing process as he walk down the path of restoration. It's just after 2 p.m. on July the 6th, 2015. It's the time of year Wimbledon is on television, also the Tour de France. They've also announced uh, water restrictions for the first time in 32 years in Bloemfontein, which is where I live in um, the central parts of South Africa. My name is Nick van der Leek. I'm a freelance photojournalist. I write for magazines like uh, GQ, Country Life. I'm also an author. Of the weekend, um, a book that I wrote with Lisa Wilson uh, was, was published on Amazon. It's currently uh, ranked number two on Amazon. Um, it's our 15th book uh, on true crime. Um, I'm going to take you on a visual as well as a narrative journey um, with Lisa Wilson. We'll be following um, the journey of two people. Um, and um, we we also be two people following um, that journey. So it's really um, there's kind of a dichotomy in the sense that you have Lisa and I following um, you know two other people, which is Oscar Pistorius and and Reeves Um Lisa's on the other side of the world. She's uh, she lives in Irvine, California, um, and I'm uh, in South Africa. And uh, we're going to look at how our questions about Oscar led us to a series of best-selling books and, and took us on a journey through the universalism of the human story. While this narrative is primarily about our interrogation of Oscar, um, in November the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein will hear um, the, the appeal uh, via the state. Uh, uh, Harry Nell has, has applied, you know, to have the court um, listen to some of the legal uh, evidence once again, and uh, th that's happening uh, literally in, in, in a few months in my hometown. But while, while this narrative is primarily about our interrogation of Oscar, you know, with this appeal uh, imminent, it's also a very personal story about heroism uh, and about justice. And um, our personal race for truth during a lifetime. As we investigate Oscar Pistorius and Reva Steenkamp in their lives, we'll also turn the focus back to ourselves uh, as runners on our various roads, as races in our races, in, in our race of truth. Um, you know, one thing with the Tour de France is it's, um, it starts off with a time trial. And uh, in that time trial, it's really just one person at a time against the clock. And, um, you know, it's, it's called the race of truth and, and there's nowhere to hide. And, um, you know, it's kind of a metaphor for the, for the human story. Um, you know, um, we may think we, we can hide. We, we may think that we... Um, you know, we can present ourselves in a certain way, but at the end of the day, 
you know, reality kind of speaks better than any man. And, um, you know, once when once once we're in a courtroom um, with, the, with the world media on us, um, you know, interestingly, one, one can still hide in a, in a sense behind legal shenanigans. But um, there's also the court of public opinion. There's also the, the narrative. And, and w once one examines the narrative, um, you see patterns of behavior and you begin to see... Um, personalities and you begin to see the authenticity of the race and that's really what we're going to be talking about uh, in these uh, documentaries. Um, we'll probe powerful questions about authenticity uh, within the human drama throughout these episodes and um, it's really um, it really starts the, the story really starts a year ago um, where um, on the 6th of July, 2014, it was extremely cold, um, a cold night in Bloemfontein and, and I guess the rest of South Africa. It was the coldest night of the year, in fact. Um, but that was the day that um, an Australian TV channel released Oscar's reenactment video and um, it really shocked the world. You know, for the first time, people saw... Oscar the way he really is. Um, you know, it was shocking because no one had seen Oscar the way he really is. And, uh, you know, we saw him not as dapper as we used to seeing him. We, we saw a man who we used to seeing as a sort of a superhero. Um, you know, they called him the Blade Runner. And, and he was a person who could barely walk. Someone who was um, sort of cast as the fastest man of no, on, on no legs, uh, you know, a heroic figure was someone who could barely stand, uh, and 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 who looked very short, and and um, you know, given one's conventional ideas of um, you know um, masculinity, um, this this short person who, who could barely walk was not not this 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 sort of hyper masculine machine. You know, the, the bullet out of the gun that, that wasn't um, our impression of him. And so on this very cold day in South Africa, this was released in Australia and, um, you know, it obviously made news headlines. And uh, meanwhile, on the other side of the world, um, here I was in South Africa and, and I just finished um, my third book on the Oscar trial. Um, and I had been uh, asked to do an interview on a local radio station called OFM. And the interview was really based on the, the first book I'd written, which was Reva in her own words. And um, the interesting thing with with that book was it, it was never meant to be a book. It was it was really just me asking questions, just me wondering who Reva Sienkamp was. And, uh, you know, it's a year later, and I still don't think many of those questions have been either asked or answered, um, not by the media, not by, to some extent, even by um, Reva's family. Her mother has published a book, but um, a lot of the pertinent questions that 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 I wanted to know um, were not were not being sort of um, you know uh, circulating in the media, and, and you know I wanted I wanted to know what Reva's story was, and so that was how it started for me. It, it didn't start uh, you know wanting to write a magazine article. It, it literally started just with asking questions. You know who is Reva, and. Um, and then I, um, because I'm a, a photographer and, um, you know, I've got kind of a network on Facebook, I just typed in Reva's name and, and uh, as sure as nuts, um, you know, we, we are friends on Facebook and uh, I started looking at what she was saying on Facebook and, and um, uh, I was really astonished. And, and anyway, this interview on OFM was really about how... Um, how that whole experience of, of asking questions led to um, putting down a narrative and um, you know, and, and then eventually um, offering it to a magazine when 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 no one else had had done something um, I don't know to to honor Eva's story and um, and having done that um, you know a magazine did actually accept the story and then. And then months went by and it was never used. And uh, and I was actually prepared to leave it at that. You know, the story wasn't, you know, good enough or whatever it was. And that was when I met another writer and, and he, uh, you know, told him about some, some of the work I'd been doing recently. And, and I mentioned the the um, 
the uh, the narrative of, on uh, reviewing own words and it's not a conventional magazine story it was um, you know a 10,000 word article which which I, I supposed could could be broken down into a four part series or something like that and um and um yeah i mean even when i wrote the story based on on um reva's own words you know her own comments on facebook you know when i was writing the story i, I didn't really know whether it would be um would be a story worth telling or i, I don't really know but i i intuited that it, it probably would be because just looking at the quality of disclosure on facebook the you know the consistency of it the um the the genuineness of it really uh, i was actually very impressed with her and i couldn't help thinking if someone had to do that kind of analysis on me um you know i think there would be a lot of um updates um uh, that that you know that, that that i would have to explain and and that would would not sit very well um kind of on a on a pedestal uh, you know in in um you know in the gaze of of many different people and and yet Reva's um, Reva's story w was actually very impressive and and um, also uh, a triumphant story. You know, if, if Oscar's story was heroic, so was Reva's. Um, if Oscar had gone through this trauma of emergence, so had Reva. And so, um, so yeah, I mean that, that was really how it came about. Um, it was really just curiosity, uh, which led to in this vacuum of no one talking about it, led to me feeling well. I, I think. I think it's important that this story is, um, you know, is is seen and heard, and and then it it, it wasn't because the magazine ultimately uh, decided not to go with it. Um, you know, a couple of months went by, and then there was also the um, Reva Income's birthday, and, and I wanted it to be published then, kind of as a tribute to her, and 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 then that was on the cards, and then it wasn't. Anyway, and long story short, I eventually. Um, met this this other writer and, and he said to me uh why don't you publish it on amazon and and i'd never heard of that and um so anyway the the discussion with a uh, ofm with the radio station uh, the presenter's name was your knife on hasty and it was really to talk about this whole idea of of um you know converting um facebook um status updates, uh, converting, you know, personal disclosures on social media to a kind of narrative in, in someone's own words. And, um, and, um, and the result, you know, was that when it was published, it, it sold uh, every single day, you know, um, w w after publishing it, of course, I had no idea what to expect, you know, would anyone be interested? Um, and, um, yeah, it, it sold every single day for about, 200 straight days and and uh, it became the best reviewed book in the in what became eventually a series on the Oscar trial but that's really how it started for me you know it really just started with who's Reva and uh, I really had no intention to write a magazine article even uh, or even a book uh, it really just became asking more questions and, and and not having these not seeing these questions asked anywhere else and uh, and that really was it and um, what made all of this kind of crucial was, you know, I'm talking about a year ago today, um, July, July 6th and 7th, 2014, was really the fact that, you know, on the Monday, the question was, this Australian television channel having, you know, broadcast this um, highly sensitive um, reenactment video, it's literally Oscar reenacting the crime, you know, using his sister as um, you know, as a as a model for Reva, um, you know, showing showing um, how he carried uh, Reva out of the the toilet, how he carried her downstairs, how he approached the the toilet door, all all these things he was he was kind of reenacting. And the interesting thing was um, what he said in court and the reenactment video; they were actually a contradiction. So. So in a way, you, you would have expected the prosecution to to seize the reenactment video and say, well, you know, um, he has further evidence. But of course, if they had done that, um, uh, the defense could claim that it was privileged information, which which was um, used without their permission. And as a result, a, a mistrial should be declared. And um, so I was very interested to see 
that day what would happen and um, social media was going nuts uh, it was one of the busiest uh, and most sort of um, people were waiting with bated breath uh, on social media to see what was going to happen and um, you know there was a lot of conjecture um, I still contacted um, a, a local um, commentator on the Oscar Troll channel um, David Dadich and I also suggested to him, you know, sh surely the prosecution are going to ignore um, the reenactment video completely. They're not going to mention it. Um, no one's going to mention it. And um, hope and, and the the defense are going to be hoping that someone does mention it so that they can say, well, you know, this is a trial by media. Um, you know, there's been privileged information that's that's been leaked, and and it's and it's it's pretty prejudicial to their client and. And, um, you know, everyone was expecting some kind of fireworks in court. And um, literally what happened was, you know, court proceedings were, were uh, commenced with absolutely no, it was, it was like nothing had happened. And, um, and that's exactly how the courtroom needs to operate is, is you know, especially in South Africa. Um, the prosecutor, the, the, the attorneys, the, you know, the, the judge, they are not supposed to really pay attention to the media, the, the, the what happens, um, you know, the, the, the justice is determined in a courtroom, not, not by paying attention to what people are saying in newspapers. So, so that was quite interesting, but um, I, I must say as, as confident as I was, I, I nevertheless held my breath as well because um, had, um, had uh, Harry Nell mentioned the video, it's possible that the the case could have been dismissed. It's possible that um, people could have been sued who'd, who'd um, rebroadcast that particular video. Um, and it's also possible with all that going on, you could have had a, a kind of a backlash. You could have had Oscar exonerated there and then, and you could have had um, you know him basically suing everyone and anyone that had that had crossed him up until that point and, and um, I could I could have been one of them and um, so I, I, I did feel especially going on t onto the radio uh, the very same day as that interview I, I definitely felt um, that there was a, a lot riding on it um, you know, it was a pretentious um, time and um, and I wasn't sure what the outcome was going to be, and um, uh, yeah, and ultimately we, we know what happened. We know that uh, it wasn't mentioned, and and that in the, in the end, Oscar was actually found guilty of um, culpable homicide. But that is not the end of the story, and um, we we are going to begin the story right at the beginning. We're going to begin it by going to the same place I did where, where I um, you know, was asking just a simple question, who is Reva? And, um, and it, it really all started with um, typing her name into my Facebook account. And, and that, is, that is how we're going to start this narrative. At the same time, on the other side of the world, uh, we're going to look at Lisa Wilson, um, my co-author in about half of the Oscar trial books, although we did start collaborating probably towards the third and fourth book. Um, Lisa's also going to share her journey. And, um, you know, at the time, um, uh, at the time that, that I wrote Reeve in, in her own words, I'd never met, uh, I didn't know about Lisa at all. And um, although by the time um, of the interview with this radio station, Lisa and I did know each other for approximately um, a week. So, so, so Lisa actually heard the the radio interview, and and um, and she's going to provide her thoughts and, and and feelings about it at the time. And so, we welcome you, um, the viewers, to, to follow this this journey that we went on. Um, you know, it's it's an interrogation of Oscar, but through that, um, we're going to be interrogating ma many other things, uh, including ourselves, and. While we're doing that, we want to encourage you to look at your journey and to assess the authenticity and the um, the um, the truthfulness of your journey and um, and 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 our attitudes and your attitudes to heroism and and how these need to change in order to make society and and us as individuals 
better and um, and more authentic people, so that at the end of the day, um, you know, our race of truth is a is a better race and a you know, and a race we can enjoy um, enjoy together. So that's really the game, the the aim of the game.